Lecture 10. As this is the last lesson in the first series of Divine Metaphysics, I will include some sayings from the Bible so as to convince your mind of the reality of what I have taught you. The Bible is a book that is read by most people in the world. But it is very little understood, and not until we get a grasp of the inner laws of being can we understand what the prophets were saying. They were men of wisdom who understood the laws of life. When we grasp the knowledge and wisdom of the prophets we shall also know the laws of life. Some worship intellect as a god, ignoring its limitation. When intellect says that such and such a thing must be, or that it cannot possibly be, the matter is settled forever. This is the stage in which man finds himself today. He is controlled by opinions of others, who have, in fact, a very inferior intellect, an intellect that in its present stage of unfoldment is only able to grasp a very small part of the universal mind and its laws. The feeble effort of this type of intellect is so glaringly apparent to the student of divine metaphysics that he has a feeling of sorrow rather than disgust when he sees lack and limitation in the midst of such unlimited possibilities. There are regions upon regions of reality and fact that the limited intellect cannot even dream of. The majority shut themselves off from further knowledge in their smug limited attitude towards the real things of life. Even the unfoldment of one new sense would open a new world that would bring to light facts which would completely revolutionize their entire world of conception by reason of the new information. So we see that the intellect can go only so far. Intellect believes in the things it sees. Through the senses intellect gathers information and believes also that there is nothing beyond what the senses can reveal to it. But that is a fallacy and we know it. Those who are students in divine metaphysics can enter into a new world of action through an understanding of divine laws to be able to perform feats that seem incredible to the ordinary individual. As our consciousness unfolds, we gain more and more knowledge of the universe and of man. Psychology stops when it reaches the limits of mental consciousness or, as it is called, self-consciousness and when it denies there is anything beyond the explored regions of the mind. But there are vast unexplored regions of the mind that more and more people are now beginning to experience, and there is still more to experience in the great realms of the universe. Yet those who have not experienced this knowledge deny its existence. This state of mind is a hindrance to further advancement, if we wish to advance and change our conditions. We must change from our narrow bigoted attitude to an attitude that is able to expand to the greater conception of what we are in reality. In fact, we must change ourselves, we must realize the power of our innermost thoughts. For these have the power to thwart our ambitions, our desires, our wishes. They spring up as plants do from the seeds that are planted firmly in the soil and flourish by the law of growth. These seeds are fear, doubt, limitation, refusing to acknowledge the truth. The question you may ask now is, how are we to change ourselves, to change conditions? The law of cause and effect is absolute and invariable in the realm of thought as it is in the world of material things. The most powerful affirmation is to know. To know that what we hold fast on this plane is held fast above, and what is held fast within is sure to express itself without. The outward manifestation we experience is none other than that which is held fast within. The law of cause and effect is unalterable, invariable, it is absolute. By constant knowing, it becomes part of ourselves. We are actually changing ourselves. We are making ourselves what we want to be. This constant knowing is experience plus understanding, plus wisdom, plus that realization of what you are in reality, not the outer man but the inner, the recognition that the consciousness in man is the individualization of the creative consciousness of the universe. Just as every light in the city must have electricity behind it, so must every personality have the life behind it. Life then is God and no other thing, nothing else your physical brain and body, are created by the universal intelligence only for the one purpose, namely, for that intelligence to express itself in the physical form. The universal mind. As I stated before, gives rise to the individual mind and the individual mind gives expression to the universal mind. There is no separation between them. Neither is there any separation between God and you. This so-called separation was the product of our old mental thoughts, the product of our own mind, reacting to things external to ourselves, not knowing the complete law. We reacted negatively and by so doing created images in our minds, images that were untrue, not real, not according to the truth, and these developed in our minds this sense of separation that has now become the race thought that has been produced generation after generation, and on which we are today mostly fed. We are affected by this race thought of separation, which is the root of all the troubles in the world today, 
Any individual who does not take an interest in this form of teaching is going backwards. Always remember that you either go forward or backward, you never stand still. It's this knowledge that enables humanity to understand life, this knowledge that will bring happiness, peace, good health, and plenty to every soul that acquires it. So character is not a thing of chance, it is the result of continual knowing. Ask, and it shall be given unto you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For anyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So we see that this wonderful truth which is revealed to us through the prophets is the law of life. Had it been heeded by the generations past, we should have been in a better position today. The prophets understood the law of cause and effect and saw what it would bring upon the people. It was through this understanding that they made their prophecies. In a previous lecture I spoke of Moses and the burning bush. In whatever way we interpret the story of Moses meeting the divine in the burning bush, one thing is plain. It indicates the point in his career when it became known to him that the only way of liberation for mankind was through the recognition of the oneness of all, the one being in all. And all beings are the one and one only. So we are brought back to the statement of our being the image and likeness of God. This truth then is carried down through the ages and, though buried and covered by dogmas and creeds, it still cannot be lost and completely hidden. It will rise again to its proper place in the lives of the people, to lead them into the perfect liberty of life. There is always the intelligence expressing itself through the individual who recognizes it, and it is only by the recognition of the intelligence of the universe, linked in with ours, that we can ever hope to have the expression of that intelligence through our mind and brain these being the instrument that the intelligence created for that one purpose. We ourselves are the only individuals who can hinder that expression, due to our limiting ourselves to the mortal senses and failing to see that. The power of God dwells in the soul of every human being. This great power, revealed by Jesus, came known to the world as the Christ. It will not be long before people all over the world will be crying aloud for this great truth, and then it will again be heralded as it was in the deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt. So it will be the same power that will deliver the people of God out of their self-imposed misery and slavery. There are many teachings in this world, but all of these are inferior to the teaching of Moses and Jesus, which is the final, the one and only truth. Man's creative process of thought is like unto that of the infinite, who created man in the spiritual state. And he now holds him, just as he created him, in his own image and likeness. This recognition must come from the individual, to make it a reality in his own life. And immediately the individual begins to realize this great truth, so it begins to be the property of the race. From point all begins and extends outwards. Therefore, it must also be the same in the individual. That point through which the infinite expresses the individual is the point through which the individual expresses the infinite. This so becomes the property of the race, but it must necessarily begin with the individual. We know what mass thinking can do, an individual from a platform can influence people to destroy one another for the sake of an idea, for the sake of financial interests. When man can be swayed to such an extent, then he has lost his understanding of the truth. But if he stands by the truth he will see to it that this kind of thing will not happen again. In the days of ancient Egypt the people had to be educated up to this great truth, and they have not advanced very far in this education even yet. Moses' eyes were open to see these truths as the power to expand throughout humanity and liberate the world. He realized that his mission was to set man free by educating them gradually into the true knowledge of the divine name, so that they might gain a true understanding of the law of their own being. Moses saw, in the understanding of this truth, the liberation of humanity from limitation, misery, disease, one. Then came the Master Jesus. He came to fulfill and complete the work that Moses had begun. The one showed God as the universal spirit, and the other showed this universal spirit individualized in humanity. Moses and Jesus are therefore linked together as the two great prophets who came to show man the way to his own freedom and salvation. The emancipation of the race can be attained only by the understanding and application of the law of being of the individual. When this can be developed in the race, mankind will then free itself from its own self-imposed misery and delusion. We now see so clearly how man has been misled through the intellect, the limited intellect and ignorant intellect, that did not know the completeness of the law. Modern research has shown us that the great fundamental truth was not confined to Egypt, but that it formed the ultimate center of all religions of antiquity. It was the secret in which the supreme initiation of all the highest mysteries culminated. It could not be otherwise, as it was the only ultimate conclusion to which generations of clear-headed thinking people could come, but these were sages, philosophers, 
men of wisdom and knowledge, and this final conclusion was beyond the masses. Then came creeds and dogmas, which added further confusion among the ignorant masses. Truth is lost in a mist of meaningless words that confused even the learned in our midst. The learned confused themselves and others by the spinning of words. Today it is only the sages and deep thinkers of a high standard who can pierce the veil into these great truths. Yet truth is simplicity and only the unfolded mind can grasp it. The learned are mystified in a maze of conceptions. We find, in the lower orders of priests throughout the world today, very little knowledge of the inner mysteries, but immense knowledge of ritual and formula which they practice continually without having any idea of what they are about, and so they go on mystifying the people and confusing themselves. The truth is so palpably clear to anyone who inquires deeply enough. It is that deep, deep insight and feeling within man that enables him to seek and find the root of his own being. When he searches in himself he will find this root is rigidly held in the divine spirit which gives growth to all and is the foundation upon which humanity is built. We find the people of the Christian faith praying to God for the destruction of others of the same faith while the others too, are doing the same thing. We also see those different faiths continually warring against each other. What a calamity with leaders who are blind to the truth, leading others who are blind, into destruction. You see it all over the world. If you read the newspapers you will see ignorance of the truth everywhere, mass ignorance, rights, Hindus, and the happens. Killing each other. We ourselves are not much better. I am not saying that people should not be punished for the deeds that they do, but I am sure of this. Man has never been given the authority to take another man's life. And we will find that out when we ourselves leave the physical earth. Jesus said plainly, You are worshipping something you do not know, but we are worshipping something we do know. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in reality. Hence, throughout the ages, we find an inner religion of the supreme mystery for the initiated few, and an outer religion, for the most part idolatrous, for the purpose of creating a religious dogma or creed, thereby holding the people in subjection through religion. So all through the ages, and even in our present day, the people were not left without a religion, but were given one that was thought suitable to their gross comprehension of things, this was left in the hands of the lower order of priests, who themselves were little, and all better instructed than the worshippers. Here we see how essential it is that this knowledge be given to the world to bring mankind to a better understanding, not only for the world at large, but also for the individual, because the individual as well must demonstrate in his own life the divine power that is within him. Here is a tremendous truth, that at the very moment we understand this truth we can perform it. We are not individuals who are separated from the divine mind, because we are the actual expression of that mind. Did I not say that your brain and your body is the expression of the universal intelligence? It is the means through which the intelligence can express itself in the physical form. The individual is given free will and an individual consciousness to understand and cooperate with this great infinite mind, so that the two can work in harmony and man can produce, in his own life, according to the perfect ideas that exist in the divine mind. In other instances an idea or plan drawn up in the beginning. By desires acted upon step by step by the creative power. It appears by degrees, not in regular order and sequence until it reaches completion. When we use these laws unconsciously, the objective seems so strange to us when materialized that we admire it and look upon it as if it were the work of some outside force that we do not understand. We may think it is the result of an accident, and may fail to realize the part we have played in the working of these higher laws. Many fail to perceive the workings of the creative universal intelligence and obviously believe that it is entirely the work of the personal mind, while there are others who perceive the higher intelligence quite naturally. It is by this cooperation with the higher intelligence in our own life that we know what is going to be the result. A well-known scientist said, It never occurred to me that anyone could be so dumb as not to recognize a higher intelligence. We know now that those who understand the creative scheme so well that they are quite aware of its particular activities, live unusual lives and produce unusual things. We know that when we have set a law in motion it must produce that which it was set in motion to do. There are others who, though they make progress by unconsciously including the higher intelligence in their working plans, are led astray in the byways, byways suggested to them by worry, fear, lack of confidence, who will always be led astray unless they can perceive their own negativeness and acquire a practical understanding of the Christ mind. We must see clearly our own mental action and reaction, and also see that the divine mind, when set in motion, can conquer all things. 
but when the individual thinks in terms of separation there must be fear, there must be worry, led into byways, led astray, because there is no cooperation with the divine intelligence, and all the time the universal mind is waiting to express itself through you. It is not what happens to us in our life, but our reaction to these things that counts. No matter what name we give the creative power, this power manifests itself to an individual in exact correspondence to the state of mind in which the individual unites with the creative power. When we consciously use the Christ mind, we depend for power and ideas upon him that is able to exceeding abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. This way all the possibilities and the power we attribute to God in the ordinary sense of the word are utilized in our own lives. Thus, through the channels of our mind, we can continuously accomplish the things we otherwise could never achieve by ourselves in our ignorance of the truth. The universal mind can express itself only through the individual mind that recognizes it and the laws of the indwelling Christ power to produce. The Christ is the link between God and the individual. The Christ is the individualized spirit of God. He is the Son of God, the individualization of God Himself. He becomes the individual and He knows. So the Christ sees both, knows both, knows the weakness of the flesh and the power of the spirit. The Christ is the highest manifestation of the individual spirit recognizing its own source, and also seeing the negativeness of the individual ignorant of the truth. The Christ sees the real and the unreal, knows which is the real, and corrects error with truth. It is a continual knowing that is so essential in this everyday life. Therefore if a man be in Christ he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. So few realize that all the power and all the possibilities that are attributed to God and the Christ can be consciously employed by us through the channels of our minds for the purpose of creating for us whatsoever we ask. Let this Christ mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be the likeness of God. There are things that mankind desires. These are love, health, abundance. Love is the greatest of all, because it means the greatest to every soul that lies. These things in themselves, though great and most desirable, can be obtained only through first attaining to wisdom. Wisdom is within, and this wisdom includes things in their perfect form. The body is the wisdom of God. The body in the perfect form is the wisdom of God. The body in disease is the ignorance of man. It was this Christ that Jesus showed, so that all could follow in his footsteps. And by the Christ he healed. It is only through the Christ that the world can be made wiser and better. The wisdom of this world is not the wisdom of the Christ. Because in the Christ there is no error, but through the Christ all error is destroyed. For the Christ is the love of God. The Christ analyzes all misery and trouble and liberates the soul from this world of error. This Christ power is in you and is the individualized spirit of God. No matter what name you would like to call it, it remains the same always. Act on the word instead of merely listening to it and deluding yourselves. For whoever listens and does nothing, is like a man who glances at his natural face in a mirror, he glances at himself, goes off, and at once forgets what he was like. Whereas he who gazes into the faultless law of freedom remains in that position proving himself to be no forgetful listener but an active agent, he will be blessed in his activity. Is that not plain enough? To think correctly and accurately we must know the truth. When truth is the underlying principle in every individual life, in every business, in social relations, right action is the outcome. To know the truth is to be sure, to be confident. It is the only solid ground in a world of doubt. Conflict, danger, disease and misery, and it gives a satisfaction that nothing else can give. To know the truth is to be in harmony with the infinite and omnipotent power. We must connect ourselves with this power which is irresistible, and which will sweep away every kind of discord, in harmony, doubt or error. This truth is real, is mighty, and it will prevail when all that seems shall pass away. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Our ability to decree a thing is God's provision whereby human events and material circumstances may be created. Our ability to decree a thing enables God to produce for us. That is the true meaning of it. Those who acquaint themselves with the power of Christ within can specify with authority what they desire, knowing that they are expressing powers conferred for this particular purpose. Whether we are conscious of it or not, faith and fear are the two activities of the mind responsible for the things which are making or breaking our lives. How to direct the creative power wisely is the knowledge we are all seeking. 
lack of this power and the unconscious use of this power are at the root of all failures, unhappiness, and much ill health. The humblest intellect can readily foretell the result of every action when he knows that it is based on truth. But the mightiest intellect, the most profound and penetrating mind, loses its way hopelessly and can form no conception of the results which may ensue when his hopes are based upon a foundation he knows too. Be false, today it is necessary to be able to apply the law intelligently, and to do this we must realize that the spirit is whole and perfect, because one part cannot be perfect and the other imperfect. When we recognize one whole we recognize one whole thing itself, perfect and it cannot have any imperfection in it whatsoever. The fact that spirit is omnipresent is the only reality. And because it is omnipresent it must be present in every atom of your body, your brain and every atom of space. It is this reason this understanding, that enables the mind to produce what it feels and knows, because of a surety what you feel and know in your own mind will be produced outwardly. If you fear disease and trouble, that fear will come upon you. Be confident in the law understanding that it is God's pleasure to produce what you decree, and the law is that believing is receiving. Spirit is omnipresent, the only reality. This is the Christ in you which is not subject to disease or sickness. And when your mind sees this great truth clearly every cell in your body will take on wholeness. If you see sickness, sickness will manifest. If you see perfection, perfection will manifest. Truth dissolves error away to nothingness where it belongs. The greatest and most potent affirmation is to know. One can repeat an affirmation if one feels that the mind is more satisfied with the spoken affirmation. I am whole, perfect, strong, loving, harmonious and happy, this being in strict accordance with the truth. It helps to remove error and discord, but to repeat an affirmation to be effective the prerequisite state is a supreme knowing that nothing can move, and it is this knowing we must get. This knowledge, repeated to you, gives you a feeling that your mind is changing for the better, your circumstances are changing for the better, you are changing for the better. If people only knew what they could get out of this they would be seeking in their thousands. But do you not see that the student has to be ready before the master appears? It is the state of knowing that is the foundation of our being. Therefore the most effective affirmation is to know the truth. When thou passest through the waters I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Some will say, and with sincerity, and with the pressure of world conditions, and with life moving so rapidly it is difficult for many of us to find time to do much conscious thinking. Nevertheless, thinking for the purpose of thinking the thoughts that will produce results for us necessitates time and conscious effort. We must have at the back of our mind an awareness that is built up through the practice of our conscious thinking. Even in the heat and strife of business life this awareness is present as a guiding factor in our lives. We can never lose it, it must become part of ourselves. It is only by thinking that these laws can be discovered and applied at will. They can be relied upon because they are immutable. Intelligent asking and intelligent believing are the steps to be taken for conscious creation. If we can understand and respect these laws, we can employ the universal mental activities for our own benefit and for the benefit of others as well. Here is the mighty truth. The results of modern science are God's reward to man for making this intelligent mental effort. What I want to bring most vividly to your notice is that your wealth lies in the creative power, not in the things created. This is the eternal truth in all spheres of life in the universe. The majority of people lose themselves in the things created, with the result that their minds are always on the things created, and never on the creative power. Consequently, they never get the results they should get, because of the misapplication of the law. We find this individual use of the creative power that creates for the individual whatever he asks in the law of believing is receiving. This is revealed to those who understand and act upon the simple method taught by Jesus, who revealed the Christ mind in all human beings. The things asked for cease to be the paramount longing in the human heart. To know and employ that which produces all things becomes the wealth of human experience. Here is the great and mighty thing that you must see in your own lives. Do not be led astray by the glitter and tinsel of the external. Immediately you gaze upon the thing desired you are led astray through fear, doubt and anxiousness, and the law is not applied completely. But when you gaze upon that creative power that enables all things to be manifested according to the idea which is held there, you know that what you create internally shall be produced externally. What you hold in secret shall be revealed on the housetops. So learn this quickly now. The things you ask for cease to be the paramount longing in the human heart. 
To know and employ that which produces all things becomes the wealth of human experience. I am the source of all things, for I dwell in thee. Ask me and I shall shower you with every good gift. Because have I not created thee so that I should make thee the channel for my own divine expression? Look to me, to me alone, and I will satisfy thy thirst, and more shall I do. I shall set thee upon the throne of thine own kingdom to do, with it whatever thou desireth. I shall guide you with my counsel and afterwards you shall receive my glory. Meditation. Silence. Benediction. Great and mighty eternal spirit, thou hast shown us the way. By means of creation becomes our acceptance, and when we look unto thee we see the law fulfilled. We thank thee for the wisdom thou hast bestowed upon us and revealed to us through these lessons. May the succeeding lessons in the advanced class of the Master's divine metaphysics be even greater, and bestow more of thy wisdom, so that the teaching of every student shall become a blessing to the work and a glory to thyself. So mode I TV.